to Journey Cotton, a second year PhD candidate at the University of Exeter studying English. She obtained her bachelor's, uh, bachelor degrees from Lubbock Christian University in English, focusing in literature and humanities um, and focusing in pre-law. She also has a master's degree uh, in English literature, focusing on the Victorian and Romantic periods at the University of Bristol. Her current field of study uses environmental bioethics as a framework for the literature of J.R.R. Tolkien. She is interested in bioethics, ecology and body studies. Welcome, Joan. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. So yeah, I'm Journey Cotton. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter, as Will said, and I'm really excited to be here because my thesis is thinking about Tolkien. So this is like the perfect place for me. So thank you all so much for having me. It's a delight. Okay, so yes, my paper is entitled, All Roads Are Now Bent, Ethical Readings of Corporality in Numenor. So, as the advent of the anthrop Anthropocene commenced the significant impact the human has upon the Earth's ecology and geology, the narrative people tell about themselves and the world is deeply tied to it. In Dark Ecology for a Logic of Future Coexistence, Timothy Morden observes that generally the Anthropocene is thought of as naming two levels we usually think are distinct geology and humanity. Thus, it is part of this paper's aim to complicate the idea of these two layers and perhaps push the boundaries between humanity and the earth to engage more deeply in the interconnectedness of the human, of other beings, and the environment. Tolkien's progressive framing of the human in his lore is striking. Instead of taking a heavily anthropocentric perspective, Nick Groom notes in Nazgul Taller Than Night, Tolkien and Speculative Realism, that Tolkien decentered human agency in his works and thus helped to normalize the non anthropocentric, human centered narrative, which has already been developing. By decentering the human, the texts allow allows more room and value to be assigned to the other sentient beings dwelling in Middle Earth. This space also allows for greater engagement with the non-human parts of the world, including plants and animals. The environment and its descriptions take notable space in the text and even have roles of agency. Middle Earth, as we know, was created as a flat world, but the destructive and unethical actions of the Numenorians resulted in not only a change in the environment and landscape, but also the world's shape into a globe where all roads are now bent. Throughout Tolkien's Legendarium, there is a focus on the physicality of beings and the landscape in connection to their ethical and moral decisions. Numenor offers an example of unethical decisions that have catastrophic consequences on the environment and ultimately beings inhabiting the space. My reading of the text uses the interdisciplinary lens of environmental bioethics to study corporality in Tolkien's Legendarium. Tolkien's texts are centrally concerned with the idea of death and questions concer concerning immortality due to Tolkien's preoccupation with things like aging in connection to serial longevity and death as an escape, which he considered to be the topic Rings was mainly concerned with. This preoccupation seems driven by fear. Anna Milan observes that ultimately the fear of death is replaced by the fear of decrepitude and barrenness. This fear of death and degeneration is also a fear of the loss over the body and the um, control over the environment. In theorizing in a space of ambivalent openness, eco-criticism and ecophobia, Simon C. S. Stock notes that the contempt and fear we feel for the agency of the natural environment needs theorizing. So I shall discuss the presence of destruction, death, and the impact on locations to consider the relationship to geography from a holistic perspective on health to demonstrate the connection between the failure of ethics and the detriment of the body of the land and consequentially its inhabitants. Thus, the fall of Numenor serves as an excellent example for us to think about together. 
This paper shall consider the paths that have caused the bending of all roads. So I argue that this attempt to erase the vulnerable, weak, and aging members of the Numenorean society is um, what has caused this resulting environmental catastrophe in Numenor and appears to be unfolding again in Gondor. And it may be read through Rob Nixon's lens of slow violence. Nixon's slow violence refers to violence of a gradual nature that slowly degrades um, such as the long dyings, the staggered and staggeringly discounted casualties, both human and ecological, that result from war's toxic aftermaths or climate change, which are underrepresented in strategic planning as well as in human memory. This plotting destruction is the work of degrees and not typically overt or instantly cataclysmic. Faramir describes Gondor as falling by degrees into dotage, which situates Gondor as an aging body that is becoming senile in my reading. Gondor's misguided approach to death and aging and the Numenorean's persistence desire for life, um, endless life unchanging, is the same attitude that led to the loss of their old kingdom. Although the apocalypse of Numenor is not in and of itself a depiction of slow violence, um, I argued that it's what sets the stage for the results that um, unfold in Gondor, which are, as Numenorians attempted to harness power over death by going to the Undying Lands, um, this causes Numenor to be apocalypt apocalyptically destroyed and the environment that they originally inhabited, um, which used to be wonderful, was now degraded and that also impacted their bodies. So this perspective of, um, so this perspective and the intervention in death situates aging in their society as an indication of failure. So the next thing we are thinking about is Numenor and catastrophic geographical ramifications, the drowning of Numenor. Tolkien's legendarium encompasses a variety of textual components he created, such as histories, timelines, invented languages, maps, and even astronomy, which, which serve to provide a greater sense of depth to the space, place, and reality of Middle-earth. Tolkien's construction of Middle-earth is innately a textual production supported by texts referencing a found history of a distant and scarcely remembered past. This history's eco-geography even shapes the nature of the earth and is shaped by the catastrophe of Numenor. The failure of ethics of the Numenorians caused the demise of the land of Numenor and the resulting consequences on the environment, animals, health, and humans. Gerard Hines notes that as Tolkien wrote mythology, he included geomythology in order to develop more fully the historical, fantastic, and literary context um, of his works through solidifying it with geological basis as he did in other areas mentioned above. Thus, Nimnor serves as an excellent case study to consider what Peter Hatman and Helen Hazen explain um, through health geography, which focuses on the importance of variations across space with an emphasis on concepts such as location, direction, and place. Ina Haberman and Nicholas Kuhn Note that Tolkien created in Middle Earth an intricate and symbolic topography that advocates for a careful stewardship of the environment. Often in Tolkien's work, this advocation for sustainability and environmental facets are expressed by an exploration of extreme negative consequences that arise from negligence to the biotic and environmental factors as expressed in the Tale of Numenor. So if we follow the three faithful houses of Edain, um, they were given wisdom and power in life more enduring than others of the mortal race had possessed, as well as the land of gift for them to dwell in known as Numenor. They were also given a greater length of life than normal mortal men, yet they did not escape from the doom of death. Though their years were long and they knew no sickness, ere the shadow fell upon them, therefore they grew wise and glorious and all things more like to the firstborn than any other kindreds of men. And they were tall, taller than the tallest of the sons of Middle Earth. And the light of their eyes were like bright stars. So we see in this instance, the body of the inhabitants were imbued through the environment of Numenor with heightened health, 
as we read in this quote above. The effects of the environment on the bodies exhibits features of Manhattan's and Hazen's perspective that ecological approaches focus on humans as biological entities, recognizing that people are part of interdependent ecological systems, such as the relationship between humans and their natural and built environments. And by built, we're meaning the human constructed parts of landscapes, such as buildings, dams, and roads. The only apparent limitation put upon the inhabitants was a spatial parameter that they should not sell so far westward that coasts of Numenor could no longer be seen. This parameter was intended to discourage temptation from the immortal aspects of the blessed realm. An example of the connection between the ecological ethical failure in Numenor that has adverse and violent effects on the bodies of the land and beings may be observed when Sauron dwelling as a hostage in Numenor rises to influence and causes a mighty temple built in the center of Numenor, culminating in that first pyre upon the altar, which Sauron kindled with hewn wood of Nimloth, a sacred tree, and it crackled and was consumed. The land lay under a cloud for seven days. The people of Numenor made sacrifice unto Melkor that he should release them from death, and they usually chose human sacrifice from sacrifices from amongst the faithful who did not worship Melkor. So not only do we read echo-geographical effects in these um, quotes above, but also uh, embodied manifestation of violence that leads harm to humans as well as, as plants and the environment. Ultimately, Sauron poisons the mind of King Harparazon, who in turn breaches the probation to sell west outside of out of the sight of Numenor, leading to it being utterly destroyed. For it was nigh to the east of the great rift, and its foundations were overturned, and it fell and went down into darkness and is no more. For Iluvatar cast back the great seas west of Middle Earth, and the empty lands east of it, and new lands and new seas were made, and the world was diminished. According to Tolkien, the motivation for the Numenorians' war was to take the undying lands by force of a great armada, and that's all due to their lust for corporal immortality, which necessitated a catastrophic change in the shape of the earth. Therefore, this reinforces the tie between the corporal degeneration and even the shape of the earth. The unethical actions on the part of the Numenorians to try and take immortality by force led to a cataclysmic destruction of the land itself and the gradual degeneration of their bodies as demonstrated later in the people of Gondor and even this change from the world as a globe with a boundary to disallow mortals from reaching the dying land. So in the Silmarillion, this event is referred to as Atlante in um, the Alderian tongue. Notably, it bears similarities in names and narrative to the Atlantis myth. Tolkien's myth deviates from similarities with the Atlantis myth as this calamity impacts the rest of the geography of Middle Earth. During this event, all coastal regions of the world suffered great change and ruin all at the same time. The seas invaded the lands and shores floundered and ancient isles were drowned New isles were uplifted and hills crumbled and rivers were turned into strange courses. The destruction of Numenor and the apocalyptic elements may be best understood through the lens of geomythology, which interprets certain myths and legends in terms of geological events that may have been witnessed by the human cultures who recorded the myths. The destruction, ruin, and corruption of Numenor's land, animals, and environments, and human is total. Even the form of Sauron is corrupted during these events. A significant factor of the lasting impact of Numenor's destruction is demonstrated through the Dunedain's later voyages. The Dunedain believed in life beyond those of their body's life, and they longed to escape from the shadows of their exile, for the sorrow of the thought of death had pursued them over the deeps of the sea but they found it not. The Dunedain and the land of Numenor exhibit the close connection between the environment and bodies. So in conclusion, there is an embedded 
um, connection between the Numenorean's lust for corporal immortality and the death and the destruction to the bodies of the people of Middle Earth, especially the Numenoreans. Finally, the nature of the world has changed. The Dunedain discover from those that sailed furthest um, that there was a girdle set about the earth and they returned weary at last to the place of their beginning. And they said, all roads are now bent. After the fall of Numenor, the world was indeed made round. The ability to physically sell to the undying lands is no longer possible, as I've reiterated, for immortals. Middle Earth's form and body has changed, and this manifestly connects to Brody's conclusion that the environment and inhabitants' well-being are intrinsically tied. If the environment is degraded, our lives, our futures, and our children's existence are all threatened. This paper offers a reading of Tolkien's Legendarium through an interdisciplinary framework of health geography and environmental bioethics to consider the lust after immortality in a corporal form in an attempt to evade death that is legible in even the body of place and the beings of the people of Numenor. Although our roads exist on a globe, perhaps the destruction wreaked on the planet are bending pathways due to the unethical environmental actions um, or environmentally harmful modes of travel and acts of slow violence that occur in our world. They have real impact and real bioethical consequences on bodies and have also altered the pathways we now take. There may come a day that our pathways are altered owing to our treatment of the environment due to the rise of ocean waters, the scarcity of resources, or the degradation of, of environments affecting human health and welfare. May we heed the tell of the drowning of Numenor. Thank you. My story says, yep. Amazing. Oh, that's coming through, isn't it? Yeah, amazing. Thank you very much, Journey, for sharing this. Um, yet again, just as a very different take, you might notice how each paper is very different. There were 40 paper submissions. I, that's the point I'm trying to get at. So whittling it down was very tough. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. So a, a, a different refreshing take and bringing in new lenses in a way of reading Tolkien as well. So thank you. Um, okay, so if you are online, please do share your questions uh, with us using, using, using the q and function. Um, just going to jump into the room quickly. Do we have any questions from our in-person audience for Jeremy? Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's fine. There's a couple online. Um, right, so, hello, Journey. Um, I found your paper very interesting. My question is, do you think that if in some way the new, um, let me try that again. Do you think that uh, in some way the Numenorean environment would have been, would have been different? Oh my goodness, what am I trying to read? The, the question is split over two points. Sorry, bear with me. Uh, do you think that if in some way the Numenorean environment uh, would have been different, everything would have turned out different. Ooh, that's that's a really awesome question. Um, well, yeah, you know, if we're just going textually, yes, because it's due to acts of the Numenorians that the world became a globe. So, I mean, yeah, the world was fundamentally changed. I hadn't really thought about this perspective so i'll i will give more thought to it but yeah great question so thank you cool. um okay jump back uh into the room does anyone have yes lovely You're back. thank you i was just really intrigued by the connection you made at the end of your talk that in some ways we're doing a slow motion a calabeth in our own lives right with rising sea waters and bringing about our own destruction through our own hubris, right? It's sort of fascinating to think about then the Akalabeth as kind of a, um, you know, precursor, right? Because he wrote that so long before we were really talking about these issues. Um, and I do apologize because I missed the very beginning of your talk if you already covered this, 
But I was really curious with how your ideas about the physical bodies of the Numenorians being related to the physical space that they embody, how that relates to their um, the error they make in believing that the blessed lands imbue the inhabitants with immortality, right? And that if they take the lands, then they'll they'll be similarly um, gifted. Thank you so much. That's a great question. So yeah, um, essentially, I think um, if I just take a step back, um, the general uh, thesis uh, of my argument is that when we're looking at Tolkien's text through this lens of environmental bioethics, we're thinking about um, well, just from the lens of environmental bioethics, we're thinking about a symbiotic relationship between the body of our own being to the body of the environment. And so I like to use Reynolds' frame of the extended body to think um, maybe the boundaries of the body is not as firm or as solid as we have typically been led to thought to think. And so maybe our bodies do extend into the environment. And so when we consider the bodies in Numenor, for instance, we, we look at the fact that their health is textually stated to literally be bettered, that they are taller, that they are healthier, that they live longer, partially because of this land of gift. And so that's what's so fun about <laughs> Tolkien for my research is that it, it translates so directly from this idea that you have a symbiotic relationship between health of body to health of environment. So if unhealthy bodies are in a good environment, there's the possibility to actually start degrading that environment. So it's a back and forth relationship. So maybe hypothetically, or I think it, I think it would follow with the logic of Tolkien's work that if these like said corrupted bodies to use his phrasing, um, enter a non-corrupted space that they would corrupt the space. That's just my general train of thought there. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Lovely, thank you. Okay, cool. so we've got time for one more question. Uh, Journey, you spoke to this in your conclusion, how climate crisis caused by uh, the same kind of e e ecocidal hubris uh, that doomed Numenor will soon be causing actual lands uh, and peoples to founder beneath the waves. Could you expound on how you think Tolkien's secondary world stories can help, uh, can shape us to respond more ethically in the primary world? Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that for me, the way that Tolkien's texts have helped me um, try to respond more ethically, like in our primary world, is by looking at it through theoretical lenses and then just looking at the, the, the play out in Numenor where you start making these tricky, <laughs> degrading actions. Um, there, there's going to be real consequences and that certainly plays out in our world because um, the moment that we start bending ethics and um, mistreating the environment or our bodies, it, it has real effects because, I mean, it is getting warmer. So, thank you. <laughs>